Okay, right. Uh, we're good to go. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for choosing to come to this uh, panel. I know there are other panels that you could have chosen from, uh, so I want to thank you. I also want to congratulate you because you've made the right choice, obviously. <laughs> this is far and away the best panel. Um, but uh, enough uh, frivolity because we now go to the sort of take on our serious faces. Uh, this is a very serious discussion uh, about a topic that is more and more front and center in the life of journalism all over the world today. We more and more, because of all kinds of reasons, starting from war uh, uh, to famine to climate change, uh, I suspect many of, in this, many of us in this room are finding ourselves writing, photo photographing, or editing stories about migration and displacement, um, the stories of migrants and refugees. Um, and these stories represent uh, tremendous challenges for all of us. Uh, they're ethical challenges, moral challenges, as well as logistical ones that we're all having to grapple with. Um, Indira, my friend, in the previous panel, um, cited uh, an, a very famous instance of how journalists used to cover uh, migration and refugee situations um, when she talked about the question that a British journalist asked uh, in what used to be the Belgian Congo when people were fleeing uh, that place. Uh, the, a British television journalist rushing through the airport uh, asked the question, shouted out the question, has anybody here been raped and speak English? Um, and that was, uh, for, for years and years and years, that was taught as, uh, you know, one-on-one questions not to ask in a, in a crisis like that. I think, I think it's safe to say that we've become better at dealing uh, with uh, the humanity caught in the middle of uh, these crises. But we can always learn and uh, learn to be better. And, and there is no better group of people to teach uh, uh, and share experiences than my panel today. Um, quick round of introductions uh, from the far left. Lakshmi Parthasarthi is the Chief Operating Officer of Global Press. Karim Shaheen is the Middle East Editor of New Lines Magazine. And Wei Du is the International Correspondent for Channel News Asia. I've asked each of them to, to start with a couple, few minutes of opening remarks, and then we will launch straight into questions. I want to keep some time for questions that you can ask at the end. Um, Lakshmi, why don't you start us off? Sure. Thanks, Bobby. Um, and thanks, Bobby, for joining us again. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that comment. Um, so I think there's really, there's three things that we all need to carefully consider when dealing with vulnerable populations in particular. Um, the first is that often these stories are about people that they're not for. And so ensuring that we are thinking about the language that these stories are pu published in, the mediums that they're published on, ensuring that sources can recognize themselves in these stories. Like that is, that is number one and most paramount. I think the second is ensuring that we're telling these stories holistically often requires us to think about the migration event, both from where people are leaving and where they're going. So why are people leaving, right? And thinking about both sides of that migration. So we have reporters both in Haiti and in Mexico covering this migration story. Um, and then the third is when we are in these powerful positions to represent these people's stories, we have a responsibility to make sure that the words we use prioritize both dignity and precision in the reporting. Um, now, I'd love to talk more about that later, but I think um, dignity and precision needs to be, you know, contextualized. That means, you know, using words interchangeably like refugee, internally displaced person, or asylum seeker all very different definitions and often interchangeably used, which causes confusion to our readers. Kareem, you, you literally wrote the book on how to do this. Uh, in a previous job, you wrote, a, you, you wrote guidelines for, for sort of field reporters on how to report and how to write about uh, migration and refugees. Um, tell us a little bit about that experience and if you can give this audience a distillation of uh, your report. 
Yeah, hi. Um, sorry. Lean in. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, thank you, Bobby, for the, for the introduction and, and for the invitation to speak here. Um, I think it, it'd be easy for me, I think, to distill uh, the, the central message or, or the central point of writing about refugees and about migrants, and, and it's really kind of the, the value we place on human life. Um, and, I, and I think that that's the, the if, if you take that as a central tenet to your reporting and to your writing and to how you approach all of these stories, um, I think that that's going to, uh, you know, replace any, uh, you know, extraneous uh, questions about how I should write a story. You know, if you think of the person in front of you and, and think of the value of their existence, the fact that they have their own life, their own dreams, their own memories, their own, um, uh, you know, experiences uh, back home, you know, wherever they've been displaced to, um, and, and try to picture yourself in the same situation and, and if you would approach things in the same way, um, then you, know, you won't go up uh, you know, into the face of a, a grieving child and try to snap a photo uh, so you can uh, you know, send it back and, and publish it. Um, you, know, you won't uh, go up to somebody and ask them uh, if they speak English and have been raped. Um, you, know, you, you would start sort of approaching uh, you know, questions of uh, the, the, the value of, of a human life in relation to your own existence and, and your own life uh, back home and, and perceive people in the same way. It's, uh, it's sort of the, the golden rule, but, but for journalism. Um, uh, you know, uh, I, I, was, uh, I was telling Bobby about this, uh, this story um, uh, from a few years ago uh, during, during a trip to Syria, and um, uh, you know, we were this, uh, with this militia group that, was, um, uh, you know, that I, was, I was speaking with, and they were escorting me. And I asked, uh, and one of them said, you know, we're spending so much, so much effort to, like, uh, you know, help you get this story. Instead, we could just kidnap you and, and make some money, um, you know, off of, uh, off of a ransom or something. And I said, I'm Egyptian, you're not going to get anything. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, but, and, and they all laughed, but it, you know, all, the, all the Syrians I had met in the course of reporting on, on refugee issues and on migrants had internalized, uh, you know, in and of themselves, this, this absence of value. Uh, to their own individual lives and to their own individual existences. Um, and that went on to inform how they interacted with the world, how they interacted with the journalists that were covering them as well. Wait, you have a little video to show us because the, the kinds of stories that you've been doing are slightly different from what yep. people usually associate with when they think about Mark. refugees and migrants. Yeah, exactly. I'm actually a little bit embarrassed to be on this panel because uh, other panelists have spent years dedicating their careers to reporting on migration. I, I've done one documentary um, about the migration of Hong Kongers to Britain. Um, if we can show the clip, I'm not going to show you all 90 minutes of it. Hong Kong's electoral system is to ensure that it is patriots administering Hong Kong. This world, world, Lewon 你們在哪裡住? Bruce Lee! <笑><笑> 
，有咁辛苦过咗去影球翻。Um, just briefly, the, ba the background of this is that because of the political and societal changes in Hong Kong, Britain essentially did what it should have done in 1997. It is to offer a pathway to citizenship to 5 million Hong Kong people. So as a result, more than 100,000 people have moved in the past year. Um, this is a story that, from where I stand, I, I, I think it's underreported in the Western press because I think two reasons to sort of confuse people. Uh, one, the Hong Kongers are not refugees. Um, they don't, for most of them, nothing terrible happened to them personally. They don't have an obligation to prove uh, they're, they're, they're sort of in fear of their safety. And I think the other reason is because Hong Kong has been an industrialized economy for a very long time. We have the most expensive housing market in the world. So when people leave, if they sell their shoebox apartment in Hong Kong, 40 square meters, then that's more than enough money for them to buy a four bedroom house outside Manchester. Uh, but that doesn't mean they don't have challenges. It's just in a way that the challenges are very different for them. And sort of as reporters, the, the, the sort of the challenges are also different for us. Yeah, these are still stories of displacement and, and people finding themselves in, in difficult circumstances. And as a journalist, when you go to cover them, it's, it's, easy, it's all too easy to forget and maybe easier in this instance to forget that they are outside of their element. And yes, it may be voluntary, but nobody likes to leave uh, their homeland. Um, they are... They are they're leaving, they made difficult choices to leave and they find themselves in a strange place. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, wh when you went into this story, what was your attitude towards these, the, yeah. the, the, the subjects of the story? And at the end of the process, did you feel that your attitude towards them had changed in any way? The way you looked at them mm. had changed in any way? Um, this documentary, I think it, it actually, you know, it, it was just more popular than we had imagined. Um, we sort of broke it into two episodes and put it on YouTube. And between the two episodes, we had three million views, um, mm -hmm. much better than anything else I've ever made. Um, in a way, when, when I come to think of what really worked in this is because the Hong Kong story I think is often told in the sort of geopolitical framework. It is against the big backdrop. When people tell the stories of people, they're talking mostly about the political activists who didn't have a choice mm. but to leave. Uh, and of course, that's a very important story to tell. But what I thought was an opening for us and what was missing was the story of the normal middle-class families. What made them make this very difficult situation uh, a decision. Um, and it's my belief that people, either they read a long form story or they spend 90 minutes watching a documentary, they're going to have to see aspects of themselves uh, in these profiles, which is why I think this family have been, you know, really open, authentic, uh, really worked well for us. Because I think that at the end of the process, um, when people watch the feedback we receive from people, is it really, it, it, it puts, it, it, you could step into their shoes and think about, if it was me, would I make these cho choices? Would I be giving up so much for my children? And when I get into an argument with my husband, do I have the ability to put him in his place? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, Surprises, not, not so much. I've lived in Hong Kong for long enough to know um, the process, but I think the resilience that the people exhibited um, in the end was the most impressive part. Karine, mm. the, the kinds of stories that, that you've written and the kinds of stories you now commission at New Lines, I, I, I think it's fair to say, are more in line with what people think of when they think of refugees and, and and, and migrants leaving areas of great crisis, war, famine, so on and so forth. Um, it was a very short clip, uh, but the point that Wei was talking about, the, the humanity of these people, sort of marries up to the point you made in your introduction about remembering that these are human beings and try to put yourself in their shoes. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would argue that, that you're the person who should be 
on this panel the most because you've actually cracked the code of making a story about migrants and refugees popular and, and, and actually interesting for people to, to, to read and, and watch. You know, it's um, it's it's a huge it's a huge issue. Um, you know, we when we when we started New Lines a couple of years ago, uh, you know, we we started you know experimenting with ways to do stories about refugees and migrants. And what we realized is that they were some of the most shared stories on social media, but nobody read them. Um, and you know, the irony of it was that people would use it to virtue signal that hey, you know, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna share this story on Twitter because I want people to know that I care about Syria. You know, but but they never actually read the the story itself, and and so you had to kind of find original and and um, and interesting ways to to tell the same story. You know, before I was uh, with New Lines and before the Guardian, I was you know a local reporter in Lebanon, and we were doing all these um, uh, you know every every winter. Uh, this this happens um, in uh, you know where where there's like a major sort of fundraising campaign because winter comes as a surprise every single year, um, you know and and uh, and all the uh, all the tents that the refugees are staying in in Lebanon they flood and and you know they don't have a place to stay for a while, and this you know apparently occurs every year because we can't predict that you know exactly when winter is coming. Um, and, you know, nobody would read those stories. Like, we'd report on the fact that, you know, people are dying in the snow, you know, and they, they don't have shelter, and nobody cared. Nobody read those stories. Um, they, they only started reading them when we started doing a bit more, you know, personification of what was happening. So, you know, I, I did something, you know, much on a much smaller scale than what you did, you know, uh, but it was, there was a winter storm that was coming up in Lebanon, and I went and spent the night with, with one of the families there. Um, you know, that was, that was anticipating waiting for the winter storm. And people really connected with writing about the day-to-day -day experiences and, uh, you know, from the first person too, you know, this narrative perspective, people wanted to actually read a story. You know, they wanted to connect with, uh, with the individuals and the people that they were reading about. The issue was not, you know, the problem that most media outlets you know, sort of run into is nobody's reading the stories. You know, nobody's spending more than, uh, you know, 30 seconds on, on the story that's, um, uh, you know, whether it's about refugees or about any other news, uh, news issue. The, the reason that they're not reading it is because they don't want to consume stories in that way. They want to consume stories about people and about individuals and about, uh, you know, people that they can connect with and they can, they can feel, you know, empathy to. Uh, that's that's what people want, you know. It, it, and it's almost like people are sort of regressing back to. Uh, when I say regressing. I think it was better, you know, the good old days when they were reading newspapers. Um, but but people are actually doing that. Like they they want to sit and and read a curated, you know, curated news uh, for you know half an hour uh, or an hour every day. And you know, we found great success with long form journalism. They want to sit and contemplate and read and learn something new and then move on with their lives and not sort of spend their time in the you know outrage cycle um, on Twitter or on other social media or you know the, the constant you know breaking news alerts that that, that they're that they're coming that, that are coming at them. They want to read about stories about real people exactly like you did right now. Lakshmi, so often when we have uh, conversations about sensitivity uh, towards uh, stories about migrants and, and refugees, um, we assume that the stories are being told by foreigners, by outsiders, or mm, to be more blunt, by Western reporters thrown into these uh, war zones or zones of crisis, and, and we, we are asking those reporters to try and imagine themselves in those situations uh, and, and be sensitive and, be, uh, and recognize the humanity there. Global press is a, comes to these stories in a very different way. You you insist on stories being told by local people uh, wherever you are, but presumably that brings a different set of challenges. How do you prepare your local reporters to tell the stories that are taking place in their communities? Quite quite often, the migration is going outward from their communities. How do you tell those stories, and how do you prepare them for those? It's on. Um, so it's actually, it's outward and it's inward, right? So um, we learn a lot from our reporters. We're not often telling them how to tell a really good migration story because they know better than anyone what it feels to be an internally, dis what it feels like to be an internally displaced person. Um, some of them have actually experienced migration themselves. Uh, what comes to mind is one of our reporters, Merve Kavira Lunege, based in Kirumba DRC um, in the North Kivu province. She 
has experienced displacement herself. She's had to migrate. She has also had an influx of migrants into her own community. She is better positioned than me or anyone else, I think, to tell that story. And with that human touch, with those details, with those nuances um, that kind of bring the whole story to life. And I think that coupled with data visualization, um, immense research showing, you know, over 2 million people migrating within the Ituri province alone, um, actually showing, you know, these dots of people coming in and out to help readers kind of contextualize the movement of people, but then coupling that with Merve's personal experience and the source access that she has because she speaks the language, because she lives in that community and understands the challenges and people trust her, right? They trust talking to that local reporter. You said something in your opening remarks that, that stays with me, which is that we sometimes forget that we're writing these stories about people, but not for those people. They're not the consumers of the stories that we write about. But in your case, when you're writing, when you're doing journalism by local people, presumably some of your audience is local, yeah. uh, and that affects the way you frame those stories. Um, and I think there's a, there's a sort of link between what between that and what Wei did in your documentary, your audience was primarily a, a kind of Asian Hong Kong audience. Is that fair to say? Um, that's a, actually a really interesting question. When we put videos on YouTube, our biggest audience is actually North American. Mm. Um, it's very different from our TV audience, but this one specifically, Yes. But majority. when you made it, you were not thinking of a North American audience. You were thinking no, of... No, no. I think a generic Asian audience that would know a bit more about Hong Kong than probably people outside Asia. Right. And actually, that's a very relevant point you brought up because we thought this... It took about a year to film this documentary. Mm. Four months, uh, six months in Hong Kong, six months in Crewe, this tiny little town outside Manchester. My husband is from Britain. When I told them the family, when I told him the family was going to Crewe, he said the only thing he ever knew of Crewe was there was a song about somebody boarding a train to go to Birmingham, but mistakenly ended up in Crewe and just really wanted to get back to Birmingham. <laughs> Um, but interest, uh, I, I sort of, it's a puzzle that we still haven't been able to crack. It is to how to make other people care. That three million views, two million probably came from Hong Kong, one million came from Hong Kong diaspora. Um, it seems that the Brits, with these Hong Kong people living among them, didn't show as much of an interest as we thought they would. But well, Lakshmi, when, when you guys do the stories about local communities, for local communities, by local communities, how, how different are the stories from the New York Times reporting about Syria or refugees in Turkey? Yeah, I think there's two, um, two differences. One is that, you know, all of these stories have to show connection of some sort, right? So, um, you know, if we're covering families that have, you know, there, there's actually an, one of our reporters is in the audience, Linda Majuru from Zimbabwe. And Linda has done some incredible reporting on missing migrants in Zimbabwe, right? So people are missing and they assume, oh, they've gone off to South Africa or another country and they've left our family for the last 20 years. Um, but there's, there's, a real human element to those stories and connection that Linda can share where she's gained access to this, this young woman who's grown up without her mother trying to kind of decouple these traumatic experiences with whether you know her mother has left her or whether this is actually something they should be investigating and whether she's missing and you know this is potentially um, a terrible situation. So you know, I think about that human element and that connection. Any, any reader sitting in New York City could potentially think about, wow, how would I feel if my mother left for a better life? Or how would I feel if you know, I had to grow up without my family members? And what would that feel like? So I think that human connection um, is relevant regardless of where you live. Right. Um, I do think, though, that we have to often think about the language that we use, both in the interviews that we're doing, uh, you know, Linda's interviews are done in, in Shona, and also in the language that we're publishing in. So we partner with multiple local um, publications and radio programs to ensure that our content can get to a hyper-local audience. Kareem, you, you're the Middle East editor uh, for, uh, for New Lines. You, you 
grew up in the Middle East, you've lived there, uh, and you, you've worked there as a journalist, written, writing and commissioning stories for primarily a Middle Eastern audience. Now you live in Montreal, the magazine is more international. How does, when you approach a story, um, is there a big difference uh, in how you approach a story now that you have physical distance from it? Ooh, yeah, I mean, I continue to like the the interloper syndrome is is you know uh, more intense. Um, uh, you know, being being so far away, there's a lot of survivor's guilt. Um, you know, involved in in um, in the the process because um, you know I very often miss being on the ground back home and and sort of reporting there. Uh, but I also don't know anyone back home who wants to be there <laughs> and doesn't want to be in my position. Um, I think, though, it, it has given me a little bit more distance in the sense that intellectually I can grasp a little bit more the fallacies and the stereotypes that, um, you know, people can sort of fall into uh, in the process of reporting on the Middle East or on refugees and migrants. And, um, and um, you know, one of, one of the challenges we have is that obviously we're not a breaking news publication, you know, we're a long-form publication. And so a lot of what we look for is original angles and original takes on stories that have, uh, you know, that have been done in the past um, or, you know, trying to identify trends and, and, um, uh, and changes and issues uh, that, um, that haven't been reported on um, in, in the mainstream press. Um, one, of the, w one of the issues really that I, uh, you know, found quite difficult to, to come to terms with is an issue of framing. Um, and it's framing the stories of refugees and migrants as, as sort of distinct and divorced from the societies that they live in. Um, you know, so, so one example is, uh, you know, we, we tend to cover the stories of, of refugees who've, you know, gone to Europe and have experienced, um, you know, rejection from, from host societies over there. Um, you know, and, and we've, we've tended to, to hold up the mirror to Western societies and say, you know, this is what you're doing is wrong. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we, we didn't um, give enough coverage or enough justice to the stories of refugees in, you know, neighboring countries and the sort of racism that they, you know, experienced there. Um, uh, you know, Yemen, for example, hosts uh, large numbers of Syrians uh, because, uh, you know, Syria, uh, there, there was no visa requirement for them to, to go to Yemen. Sudan is the same thing. It also hosts a large number of refugees from the Horn of Africa, you know, more than Europe does. Um, Lebanon, when I was starting to report there, you know, four out of uh, one out of five people that you met in Lebanon was a Syrian refugee. Um, the Gulf countries didn't take in any refugees, um, uh, you know, and, and actually kind of ensured that only the people who were there were, were economic, um, uh, you know, workers and, and, and migrants in, in that sense. Um, so, you know, that, that that was that was part of it. But I also. Uh, you know, having like becoming a migrant, I mean, I guess an immigrant myself, um, I don't know what the culturally appropriate term, uh, you know, expat, my, uh, immigrant, uh, whatever it is, myself, um, you know, showed me a little bit of the myopia with which uh, we also tend to report about stories of assimilation and, and acclimatization of refugees. Uh, there's a writer called Dina Nairi, I think she, she writes about her experience as an Iranian uh, refugee, um, and she writes about the, uh, the right for, uh, for refugees to also be jerks. Um, <laughs> Just be complex individuals and human beings, you know, who aren't just defined by the fact that they are refugees and by the fact that they've sought refuge outside of their country, but that they're ordinary human beings who, you know, some of them are good, some of them are bad. And, and the moment we start thinking of them as these complex individuals, uh, not as these, you know, one-dimensional people that we either need to pity or, or reject, um, then, then we can we can truly appreciate who they are and what their stories are. You know, in in, in Canada, in particular, where I am now, there are, you very often see those stories of you know the this heroic refugee who saved the wedding. You know, by by because he was a tailor and, and you know fixed like the dress of someone. Um, you know, and, and you see those stories quite quite frequently. You know, and, and but but they're 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 you know they come from a good place, right? Because yeah, it's it, the intention is to say that these people are contributing to society, right? Um, but but it also is infantilizing in a sense uh, because it is about that one dimensional aspect of, of who they are that they are refugees and, and this is you know something that they did in that capacity. Yeah. Well, let me ask you something um, because you said that this that this was an unusual documentary for you to do. This was your first experience of of um, 
of, of writing about a story of displacement like this. At the end of the process, now that you've done the documentary, uh, has that changed the way you consume stories about other kinds of migration when you read the stories that, that New Lines might have done or, or Global Press might have done or in the New York Times or any other publication? When you read a story about a migrant family, do you find that you're thinking of that story differently? Um, I suppose so. It's, it's a sort of once you know how the sausage is made. Um, sometimes I am a little, I can be extremely critical of some of the um, images people project. Um, uh, going back to what Kareem said, setting up migrants as a group as either superheroes or super, super villains, uh, they're just not real people. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm more sensitive um, to that aspect of reporting, not, not to say that either of their publications that have been made that mistake before. Uh, but I also want to go back to um, what uh, Laxmi said earlier about language. Um, sort of one of the challenges for me to make documentaries about Hong Kongers is, is that I was born and raised in mainland China. Um, I, I'm not, I think once after people have met me, they're okay with me, but as, as, a, as a concept, mainland Chinese are not the most popular people in Hong Kong, and sometimes we still get comments that you, know, you couldn't find a Cantonese speaker to make this documentary, because you hear my voice. I try to ask them a question in Cantonese, I can't work it out, and they, they just say, why don't you just, just speak Mandarin? Um, I think that aspect of it is interesting to me, that who gets to tell the migrant's story? Yeah. Um, I sometimes feel the ideas are getting a little too rigid, um, and I hope you know I could use myself as an experience to say if you're willing to treat other people as your fellow human beings, and they they will reciprocate um, that respect and that trust, and it does work out. I hopefully I hope that it worked out. Actually, it just struck me that when you mentioned that, that all of us on this on this day are no more than one generation away from being migrants ourselves. Um, you know, all of us are living outside of the places where our, our ancestors came from, and, and I suspect that that colors in different ways how we consume uh, these stories. We have our own stories, the stories that our families tell us, um, and, and we weigh the stories that we're consuming, reading, or watching, uh, probably in a different way from for want of a better expression, native peoples uh, in, in the countries to which this migration is taking place. Um, when, when I'll, I'll come to the audience immediately after this. This is the, the last question that I will exercise my moderator's uh, privilege with. But to that point, uh, Lakshmi, when you commission stories, when you see stories coming back, uh, how aware of you are you of your own status and, and um, and how do you feel that affects the way you see these stories? Yeah, sorry, I was thinking about what you just said, you know, being a, I'm Canadian, living in the United States, and my parents were born and raised in India. Um, if, if someone was telling a story about my parents and their journey to Canada, and they distilled their nuanced, incredible journey as, they're immigrants. I, I don't think they would see themselves in that story. I certainly wouldn't. And so, you know, I, I think, first of all, to your question, Bobby, as Chief Operating Officer of Global Press, I should be 100% hands off in that story. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's really important from that global perspective and that global lens um, that there, we're there to also make sure that, you know, our style guide principles are applied and that, you know, our general newsroom operating model is all kind of in place, but that local reporter's perspective and story has to be prioritized above all else. Um, but you know, it does remind me of a style guide principle, which is refer to people as people, right? Don't distill someone's experience uh, to a label. Mm. 
I, I just want to say so, uh, add to that because I think that's a fantastic question. One of the reasons we conceptualized this documentary was because there was a lot of media coverage about Hong Kongers going to Britain, but most of it would end the minute they leave the airport. They sort of fl flew out of Hong Kong as if you know happily ever after they reach the land of the free, and as a migrant myself, I've lived in four or five different countries. I, I just know that's not true. I know that's not true. That's where the hard part starts. And I think the Hong Kong story is one of these stories. And maybe it's because of the political clarity that we, we are supposed to keep reinforcing this message that is political displacement. Life was terrible for them in Hong Kong. Um, that the messy bit of the integration story often isn't told. Um, I've also had that experience because I, I, I used to travel um, in North Asia, so I spent a little bit of time in South Korea and has some experience with uh, North Korean defec yeah. defectors. And that's sort of the issue there as well. You, you never really hear the stories about North Koreans having a hard time in South Korea. Some of them actually ended up going back. Uh, one of the things somebody said to me, and I thought that was that's just fantastic. How come I've never heard that before? They said their biggest challenge after receiving uh, arriving in South Korea is not knowing what to do with themselves. They ask the people who receive them, what time should I get up tomorrow and what time you want me to turn up where? And they're told, do whatever you want, you're free. And that's a concept that they, they do not necessarily have and might not necessarily get used to. And I think that that's just a fantastic story that's not really been told. Uh, can I, can I just yes, of course. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's the, it's the same it's the same with Canada. You know, the, a lot, there's there's a lot of coverage of the fact that you know Canada was was so uh, great with you know uh, taking in so many refugees from Syria. Uh, you know, at the height of the crisis, right when when a lot of countries were saying no, like that's that's enough, um, and and it's, it's it was a very laudable thing. Um, you know, but a lot of the people who ended up there, um, you know, th there was there was no follow-up of the integration story because it's not as sexy. Um, you know, it's, it's not as interesting to contemplate, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the challenges of, you know, an Arab conservative family navigating uh, their kids going through sex ed in, you know, in Canadian schools, right? Or, or you know, how, how people kind of, um, you know, coming from a society where, um, you know, LGBT rights, for instance, were, were you know, restricted, and, and then they suddenly are being told, uh, you know, we need to, um, uh, you know, integrate in this society and respect the rights of, of these individuals, and, and they do, you know, for the most part, but, you know, this is why you end up with, with silly measures, you know, like governments having these, uh, you know, values tests for, uh, you know, immigrants and, and asking them, you know, uh, silly questions like, uh, uh, you know, should you respect the rights of, of different minority groups, for example, in Canada. Um, but, you know, but it has, it has real, extremely sad consequences. You know, a few years ago, Sara Hagazi, who was, um, uh, you know, an LGBT uh, rights activist in Egypt, um, you know, who was, who was arrested for a while for raising the, uh, the rainbow flag during a concert, um, you know, she, she moved to Canada. She, uh, she, she ended up moving to Canada and then died by suicide, um, you know, um, a year or so later. Um, and, you know, her, her writings indicated how isolated she felt and how alone she felt. Um, and so, so trying to, to address those questions and trying to find out what it means to, uh, you know, once, once you're no longer, uh, you know, you don't just have that label, you know, you're a refugee or an asylum seeker or, an, or, or a migrant, and you're now part of that society. Um, you know, you're a different category of human being almost. And, and so now, how do you live? How do you contribute to that society around you? What, what, how, what is society's relationship to you uh, when you're now, uh, you know, in, uh, a new part of it? Questions from the audience. We have time for maybe a couple. Um, put your hand up. There's a lady with a mic coming around. Uh, Hi, quickly thanks. identify yourself, please, and, and if you can, keep the questions brief. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm a... Um freelance American living in Amsterdam, writing features for US magazines. Kareem, what's your advice for somebody who is reporting on the, the um, experiences of refugees, IDPs, and migrants who are still in the process of making the journey, maybe stuck on the wrong side of the med or in a non-EU European country? And how do you 
allow um, guidelines on reporting on trauma to inform your reporting without, as you say, infantilizing them and treating them as one-dimensional people as they're making that journey? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, I mean, I would, I would just, I would start by trying to identify what are the actual reasons why they're leaving. Uh, you know, because the, the reality of it, nobody wants to leave home. I think, you know, for like given the choice, given um, your ability to live in dignity, in um, uh, you know, in, in some like being economically, uh, being able to economically contribute to your society and to take care of your family and and all of these aspects of a dignified life in the West, you know, apply. Uh, in, in the Middle East as well. Um, you know, so, so the question of what is actually driving them uh, to leave and trying to identify those, those root causes, whether they're economic, whether they're political, um, whether uh, you know, they, they involve their ability to be able to say what's on their mind uh, you know, without fearing uh, for themselves, uh, the vast majority of people would not want to put themselves in a situation where they're risking their lives in order to, um, you know, to, to get somewhere else. Um, but I, I think part of it is also trying to understand the, the fears and, and the uh, anxieties of the societies that they are going to. Um, and, and I think that this is, you know, this is something that is often missing from, uh, from the reporting on the refugee crisis or on, uh, on economic migrants in general. Um, you know, and it's generally that most of the stories fell into two categories. One, uh, you know, the, the sort of trauma, tragedy, porn, um, you know, of uh, X number of migrants died trying to cross the Mediterranean. Um, to, uh, you know, the, the sort of logical conclusion of that line of reporting, uh, which is uh, let's shame both the governments and the societies for refusing to, uh, uh, you know, accommodate these individuals and that this is, you know, this death and tragedy is the outcome of that, and, and it is. But it's not super helpful. Um, uh, you know, one of one of the ways in which we tried to kind of do that in, in the magazine was to, uh, you know, we we assigned um, a rescue worker to actually write a piece for us, um, and it was it was a beautiful, heartfelt piece. You know, from an attempt to rescue uh, a number of migrants who drowned in the Mediterranean. Um, but but the the other side that's missing from that uh, is to try and truly understand what are the anxieties driving this rejection. Um, uh, you know, th there there was a lot of reporting when the Ukraine war started. You know, comparing uh, the suffering of Ukrainian refugees and the reception in Europe uh, to Syrians. Um, and um, you know, and I, I think it was I think it was somewhat unfair. Um, you know, because when Syrians were fleeing to Europe, you know. All the coverage was, uh, you know, there, there was intense amounts of coverage. I remember when I was covering the war in Syria, you know, uh, particularly during the, the Aleppo campaign, uh, the Guardian had it on their front page of the website every single day. Um, you know, people were paying attention uh, to the story. They just moved on as, as they do. And, and even back then, uh, you know, a lot of Afghan refugees I, I spoke to, you know, were complaining that the Syrians were getting first class treatment from the Germans, uh, you know, when, when, when they weren't. Um, and, and so, you know, if you, uh, if you start kind of understanding the, the reasoning for, for why these things are happening, trying to uh, properly analyze and, and integrate into your worldview, uh, you know, why those societies are, are rejecting them and, and trying to kind of um, not sympathize with the view, but trying to understand it, um, uh, you know, in order to be able to speak to everyone in, in involved in, 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 this particular, in this particular issue. I don't know if that's super helpful. It's not it's light on the practical aspects of it, um, but but it's it's always been something on, on my mind, you know, from a systematic point of view, uh, approaching reporting on these stories. We'll take one more question. Makrim, is the is that handbook that you wrote about how to cover uh, these stories? Is that available for uh, people can find online? And yeah, yeah. Oops, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, you know, there's sort of like how. Uh, uh, old school Egyptian singers would have to like stand back like six, <laughs> six meters. Um, mm. Clearly my voice is much weaker. Uh, but yes, it is, it is available. I wrote it at the time for, uh, for the Al Jazeera Media Institute. Um, if you, uh, well, I Google it. Um, you know, you can find it everywhere that is Googleable. Uh, you can just search for, for covering refugees and migrants in my name uh, and Al Jazeera. It's a very, very useful handbook. I've, I've shared it with lots and lots of people. Um, there's a question right here in front. Oh, I've got the is oh, sorry, you've got the mic. Yeah, go, for, go for it. Hi there. Uh, my name is Melissa. I'm a freelance journalist. Uh, you spoke a bit at the beginning about the challenges of getting readers to care about these stories. That's something I've definitely felt in my reporting. I've seen, you know, 
fast breaking news stories about the royals that I've been forced to write get like 10 times the amount of hits as the um, more deeply reported stories on refugee and migrants. And I'm wondering if you have examples of stories that did really well with readers and why you think that was the case, kind of examples that we could learn from. Lakshmi, you want to start? Uh, sure. So one of the stories that comes to mind is uh, this reporter I mentioned from DRC, uh, Merve Kavira Lunege. Uh, it was a long form piece uh, called I Will Not Leave This Place. And it involved, you know, uh, drone footage, uh, data visualization, maps, uh, personal accounts, um, tons of historical context. And I think there was just something so powerful about about that personal experience um, that just, again, no one else could really report on other than her. Um, but that story did really, really well for Global Press. And I think um, the other, I, I mentioned data visualization, like putting things into context visually for people when there's these you know, complex narratives about DRC and Rwanda and like where are these people coming from and going to and historically, what, how does that all make sense? Visualizing that I think helps, especially as shareables. Kareem? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was specifically those stories that were, um, uh, you know, that, that were first person narratives uh, in particular. You know, we've, um, we, we love that format uh, in our magazine. Um, often what we do is we'll bring somebody who's actually gone through the experience themselves, uh, you know, to, to write about it, um, uh, you know, in that way. Uh, the, um, the aid worker uh, example was, was one that was, that was quite popular. Um, it, it, it's just basically just whenever I've done a story or commissioned a story where I stayed out of the picture as much as possible and just let them talk um, and tell their stories like that, that sort of narrative flow um, has, has very often been, been quite successful. It's, um, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's just people want to hear about other people that are like them, you know, not about the numbers, you know. Also, La I'm sorry, go ahead. Kids, dogs, old people. <laughs> Last question, we've got literally two minutes, so the, we Thank make you. the question quick and we'll make the answers yeah. quick. It's to complement the previous question, uh, I feel like those stories, person, uh, personalized stories, work well with people who already are interested in the, in the issue and concerned by migration. I was wondering how do we reach to people that are reluctant to refugees, migrants, and especially in Europe or countries where they migrate to? Karim, I'll let you have the last word. Ooh, uh, such a big, great responsibility. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer it quickly. Um, I, I genuinely think that in, in a lot of cases, the media hasn't been speaking to those individuals at all. Um, you know, the, the vast majority of stories about refugees and migrants are about how you should feel bad because you're a society and, and your country uh, has rejected them, uh, you know, and how could you, you know, your Europe, like, you know, the, 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 the great bastion of freedom and, um, and it's just not productive. Like people don't care about that and they turn off, you know, they, they, tune, out, they tune off and they don't want to listen to what you have to say if, if what you're trying to say is reprimanding them. Um, I, it's, it's, it's hard to describe a particular format in which, uh, in which this, uh, you know, idea would work, but I, I do think long form is, uh, well suited for exploring those questions um, in in a lot more nuance uh, than you know the day to day news coverage of, of refugee stories, um, and so you need to like just take the space to go and talk to the people who are objecting to this, you know, who are uh, opposed to refugees and migrants uh, coming to their communities and trying to understand what their anxieties are, um, because. Uh, I mean, um, call me an optimist, but I don't think that most people are bad people, <laughs> um, and and most of them are fearful. You know, it's, it's like this fear and anxiety is such a natural response to to immense change. Uh, you know, in whatever form it takes, and and I think reporting that uh, tries to understand where those fears and anxieties are coming from um, are also going to be the way to defeat. I think the the forces that are, uh, you know, the, the the bad forces that are trying to make us all into nativists and and isolationists. I think uh, we've proven the case uh, that this is the best panel. Um, <laughs> and please, please find Kareem's uh, manual at, on the Al Jazeera website. Uh, read everything uh, on uh, uh, global that uh, that uh, globalpressjournal.com. Global Press, uh, sorry, thank you. Uh, and and make sure you make the time to watch Way's documentary. Uh, thank you so much for coming, ladies and gentlemen. Your panel.